Hear, O Israel. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the heavens and my help cometh from the Lord which made the heavens and the earth and he will not suffer my foot to be moved for he that keepeth Israel does not sleep nor slumber and so as the people of God we are proud for the opportunity to express our faith in our God. For our God is a great God, greatly to be praised. And he seeks at every opportunity to bless us. And so we come again to worship God to learn more about him in study, to strengthen our faith. And with these words, we greet you, all the members of the First Virginia Avenue Baptist Church who are not with us, but are sitting by your radio. We welcome you. Come close in spirit. And let us draw upon the word of God. We will have a selection coming from the brotherhood. Prayer. Another selection. And then I will come with another Bible study for our consideration. Our God is a great God. Greatly to be praised. Great. 
scripture will be coming from Psalm 47 and it reads O clap your hands all ye people shout unto the Lord with the voice of trumpet of triumph for the Lord most high is terrible he is a great king over all the earth he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet he shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, mm -hmm. whom he loved. God has gone out with a shout, yeah. the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the thrones of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. I've read the entirety of Psalm 47. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. Yeah, yeah. Hello to all of God's people. It's prayer time. To an all-wise and eternal God, we come this time giving you all honor, all glory, and all praise. We come to Heaven Father just simply say thank you. Thank you for allowing us, a few of us, your humble service, to come into this place, stand into your presence, and uplift your holy and righteous name. We also want to thank all people who are watching us through live streaming or whatever. You also are standing in God's presence. And we also want to say thank you for that as well. Dear God, we thank you this morning. You've been so good to us, dear Heavenly Father. You've been a merciful God, dear Heavenly Father. You woke us up this morning with your finger of love. The Spirit of the Lord blew breath into our bodies, dear Heavenly Father. You dusted us off, dear God, and you sent us on our way. And now, Lord, we just pray that everything we do will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You have supplied our, our need to Heavenly Father, and we thank you for that. You put food on our tables, clothes on our backs. We have a reasonable portion of health and strength. We had a place to lay our bed to Heavenly Father, and we thank you for that. We slept good to Heavenly Father because your angels watched over us. Not only all day, but they watched over us all night. And we thank you for that, dear God. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that, that you would continue to bless us with your ever-loving ever 
guidance. We pray to Heavenly Father, you continue to open our hearts, cleanse us to Heavenly Father, that we may be able to serve you in truth and in spirit. Cleanse us to Heavenly Father that no matter what we do and say, others might see us and they see you in us. They might hear us, but they hear you in us. And they may say to themselves, what must I do to have that everlasting peace? What must I do to have that love and that, that inspiration? And we pray to Heavenly Father that they will come and hear your word. Your word says, whosoever will, let them come and I will give them rest. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. Dear God, we thank you for our pastor, Reverend Charles Henry Duncan, continues to labor in this venue, continues to bring us the word on high, dear Heavenly Father. And we just pray that we continue to listen and hear and be doers of the word. Now, Lord, as we go forth in this service, we ask you to please forgive us of our many sins because we've come short. We've fallen, dear Heavenly Father, but we just know that we continue to hold on to your hands, that you will continue to bless us, you will continue to lead us and guide us. And we pray again to Heavenly Father, everything that we do will be pleasing in your sight. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, dear Heavenly Father. This is our prayer in your holy righteous name. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. I'm going to let it shine. 
song this little light of mine I'm going to let it shine think about the wording this little light of mine I'm going to let it shine. The implication is that it will shine if you let it. So it causes you to think about some of the things that would keep your light from shining. But if you could take care of those things, the light would shine. Everywhere, in every place. Simply speaking, it's saying you get out of the way and the light will shine get self out of the picture and the light will shine. And you have a light. So much for that. Tonight we begin on another one of the wonderful words in the Bible. And this word is found in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified. Freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we're going to talk about this evening man's need of redemption. This is an interesting study. And I'm of the opinion that it's going to take me three or four Tuesdays. And then I will not have adequately covered it. Man has a need of redemption because of his sin. Sin is a religious concept. Now you cannot think about sin without thinking about a religion. If there was no religion, there would be no sin. Understand what I'm saying now? There has to be a concept of God before there can be sin. You agree with that? Without churches, without worship, 
there would be no sin. Crime is against the state. Immorality is against society. But sin is against God. In a godless world, the idea of sin would have no meaning. As society loses the consciousness of God, the sense of sin also goes out of mind and heart. When we no longer think about sin, it goes out of mind and then it goes out of heart. On the other hand, as the sense and vision of God is renewed in an individual or society of people, they will be smitten with a sense of sin. When we begin to think about God, we also come to an awareness of sin. But when we remove God, we have no awareness of sin. And that accounts for some of the things that some of the politicians are doing. No consciousness of God, and therefore no awareness of sin. The Old Testament centers in God and his activity in the world. The writers of the Old Testament view man and the world in relation to God and his dealings with them. The Old Testament and the New Testament writers saw God and the world in a relationship together. And when they looked upon the world without God, they came to the conclusion that the world was sinful. Are you listening to me? There's a striking number and variety of words in the Bible dealing with sin. Now what we have just said does not mean that crime against the state or an immoral life is not sin. I didn't say that. Both the state and human social order are phases of the divine order of the world. Both the state and humanity and human society was ordained by God. And they are partial expressions of the will of God. So crime against the state or a violation of the will of God as expressed in human society is called sin. And the sin would have no meaning in a godless world. We're talking about redemption, but you can't talk about redemption without talking about sin. Sin comes as the result of temptation. Now temptation is an incitement or inducement to sin. Temptation is an offer to sin. And it comes as an offer. To sin. It comes to man as something on a platter. And it is served before man. Whew, whew. 
all through the Bible, temptation is an inducement to sin coming from the devil, all through the Bible. He offers you something. And the only way you can receive it is to be in possession of your will. Come on, come on. Animals cannot be tempted. <laughs> but man was given a will, a mind, choices. And so the devil offers for man's partaking in sin. Now, having mentioned the devil, we have to stop here and say a word or two. God did not make Satan a sinful being. Nor did God make Satan a devil. Satan made himself a devil by rebe rebelling against God. And then by giving himself to the work of enticing others to sin. How and when this took place we have no specific date. The Bible gives us the origin of sin among human beings. In Genesis 3 and 6, it's clear that the forbidden fruit appealed to three desires on Eve's part. Every one of which is a normal desire. Did you hear what I said? Every desire, it was a normal desire. The first was the physical appetite or the desire for food. Is there anything wrong with that? Come on, you can answer. There's nothing wrong with the desire for food. As a matter of fact, there's something wrong if you don't desire food. Yeah. Eve saw that the tree was good for food. It looked good to eat. And it is not morally wrong to be hungry are to desire food. It was to this that perfectly natural and normal desire for food that the devil appealed in tempting Eve and also in tempting Jesus. Jesus also had a desire for food because the devil waited until he was good and hungry. Forty days without food. Then it said that Eve saw that the tree was a delight to the eyes. It appealed to the sense of the beautiful. Is anything wrong with appreciating beauty? Well, is anything wrong with appreciating a beautiful woman? Is there anything wrong with appreciating a beautiful picture on the wall? Nothing wrong with that desire. Then it said that she saw that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Is there anything wrong with wanting knowledge? Come on. Should not we strive for knowledge? Should not we strive for food? 
Should not we strive for beauty? All of those desires are normally right. So the devil tempted Eve by appealing to these three desires that are normal in any healthy human being. Wherein then consists her sin? If all these were normal desires, wherein is the sin? The sin comes in trying to satisfy these normal desires of being in the wrong way, contrary to the will of God. Trying to satisfy normal and natural desires the wrong way which is against the will of God and that is sin. Amen, Brother Duncan. And this helps us to understand how temptation makes its appeal to desires of our nature. If we did not have certain desires, the devil could not appeal to us by our desires. I'm still talking about redemption, but you need to know redemption from what? And how it became necessary. This helps us a great deal. It lets us know that the devil doesn't have to appeal to something sinful in us. He can appeal to that which is natural and normal. And if we seek to achieve it, in any other way than the will of God requires, it becomes sin. Now, some people think the closer you get to God, some people think the more you can become religious in everyday life, The stronger you're going to become like God. But they missed it. The closer you get to God, the closer the devil tries to get to you. So we cannot stand on our record of having been in Christ for 20 and 30 years. You cannot stand on the record of what you do in the church. Because the stronger you are, the stronger comes his temptations. And he temptations you not to something that you don't desire, but in something that you desire that's normal and good. The epistle of James tells us that a man is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own lust. The thing contemplated is not temptation unless desired. Woo! Say it again, Brother Duncan. The thing contemplated, the thing that you're thinking about, is not temptation unless you desire it. Mm. 
Maybe I need to add a few words to that. The thing contemplated, the thing that you desire is not temptation unless you really desire it. You got to want it. Am I making sense? Make, make, make sense. Something passes by that's beautiful. If all you do is glance, it's not a temptation. But something passes by and you take an extra look. And if for a moment you desire, in that moment, it's a temptation for you. Unless there is an appeal to man's desire, temptation would be lacking in his power. James tells us that God cannot be tempted and that he does not tempt man. God being absolutely good, he's the source of all good and of, of the source of every good. Yet we find in the Bible that God tries men and women. But the Bible does not say that God tempts man the way the devil does. God will test man to lead man to a higher degree of righteousness. The devil will tempt him to pull him down to the level of an animal. The same event in the life of a man made from God's standpoint is a testing to develop the man. And from the devil's point, his temptation is to destroy the person. Suppose we take for a tentative definition of sin the statement that sin is rebellion against the will of God. Now one factor in man's personality, one thing that makes him as a being created in the, in, in the image of God is the power of will. To be capable of obedience or disobedience, man must have the power of choice. God said to Adam, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. That statement says that man has a choice. Doesn't it? In the day that you choose to eat, in the day that you choose not to eat, you shall not die. When it comes to animals being obedient or disobedient to God, they have no choice. They live and move by instinct. Man obeys commands from God. Why was man singled out in the beginning as the one being whom God had created to whom God should address a specific command? Go back to the early chapters of Genesis and you're going to read. And God made this. And God made that. And he made the animals, and he made the beasts, and he made the birds, and he made a man, and gave man a command. He made a bird, but he didn't give a bird a command. He made a whale, but he didn't give a whale a command. Made a dog, but he didn't give a dog a command. But he made a man and gave man a command. 
And that implied that man had the power to choose. And so sin can only be active in the midst of choice. Woo wee! Woo wee! When we sin, will you agree with me that it's by choice? Come on. It's by choice. As soon as a baby realizes that he or she has a personality, as soon as they realize that they are different from you, as soon as a child realizes he or she is different from mother or father, here comes choices. Am I right or wrong? Until a child reaches that age, you have no trouble with them. They just do what you say. You set them at the table and you put the food there and they eat it. But when they find out there's something they don't like, That's when they say, I don't want that. They're exercising their power of choice. If man's sin is willful, then it must be a sin against God. Where there's no knowledge of moral truth, there can be no sin in the full sense of the term sin. This is implied in the statement of Romans 4 and 15, which says that where there is no law, neither is there transgression. In Romans chapter 7, Paul says, when he came to know a certain thing was wrong, I did not refrain from doing it. As soon as I found out that a certain thing was wrong, that was the very thing I wanted to do. And this shows that there was an intimate connection between a knowledge of the will of God and sin as an active principle in human life. So man's choice of sin produced him to a level or cast him into a situation where he had to be redeemed because of his situation with sin. He was unable to set himself free. But the God that he denied is the God that only has the power to set him free from his predicament. And that puts us on the edge of redemption. And that's as far as we'll go this evening. Just think about how many of our sins have come by way of choice. I choose to smoke. <laughs> was a long time when I didn't, but I choose to smoke. I choose to drink. I choose to gamble. I choose to curse. <laughs> I choose to steal. <laughs> I'm not forced to do any of these things. I freely choose these things. And so I need somebody to help me to govern my own desire and to get me out of the rut that I'm in. Because I still choose many times to do wrong, although I am a child of God. Amen, Brother Duncan. Amen. Amen. I need somebody to get rid of it for me. I can't do it myself. I've tried. 
all kinds of things. I've tried. Nothing's been able to do it, but God is able to do it. And that concludes our Bible study for this evening. Wonderful word redemption. Now there's another word that's very, very close to it and it will help you. Anybody in here ever pond anything? Yeah. Okay, I heard one, one answer. Yes. What you take to the pond shop belongs to who? It belongs to you, doesn't it? But you've seen something else that you would like to have, right? Yeah. So you need some money. But you don't want to completely get rid of this in order to get that. So you take this to the pawn shop in order to get the money to get that. Now, later on, when you get some extra money, you go back to the pawn shop to redeem Come on now. <laughs> what was that? And the, and the man says, you owe. What, what do you mean I owe you? First of all, you owe the money that I gave you, and you owe the storage and so forth. So it belonged to you. You the one put it into bondage. Now you're the one that has to get it out. And so you have redeemed your ring or whatever it was that you gave in the hand of man. Well, man needs to be redeemed. That's enough for this evening. Let us have our closing song. Glory to his name. Singing glory. Glory to his name.
I'm singing glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Oh, yeah. Glory to his name. To my heart. To my heart. Was the blood. The blood applied. The blood applied. Sing it. Glory, glory. Glory to to his name come to this fountain so rich as we cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet plunge in today and be Glory, glory, glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Precious name. Glory to his name. I'm singing glory. Glory to his name. Glory, glory to his name. Glory to his name. Oh, there to my heart. To my heart was a blood applied. Singing glory. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Precious name. Singing glory to his name. Glory to his precious name. Glory to his name. Oh, there to my heart. There to my heart was the blood. Blood applied. And I'm singing glory. Glory, glory. To his name. Amen. We just discovered a new arrangement for a song to be sung some Sunday morning. And elderly the people would say a hint to the wise is sufficient. Amen. <laughs> so I'm going to be looking for that presentation, that style. Yes, sir. All right. Mm -hmm. Some Sunday morning. And it's your choice. Choice, yes, sir. Well, brothers, I made the statement this past Sunday that it seemed as if some of the restrictions were being lifted. But we're not going to embrace all of that. Amen. Let's wear our mask. Let's pay attention to all of the stipulations and keep worshiping as we're doing for a while. I cannot give you a specific date. But we've come this far. Yes, sir. And it wouldn't make sense mm -hmm. to just throw off all of the precautions. Glory, glory. Eternal God and Father. Yes, sir. First of all, Father of our Lord mm -hmm. and our Savior. That's Jesus Christ. Yes. And Father, of all those who have accepted your Son yes. as their Lord and their Savior, we come now to exercise the right that you have given us. Yes, sir. And you have given us the right of sons and daughters who may come to their father whenever they have need. Sometimes we come to the father just simply to celebrate and to honor our father. Sometimes we come because we have a need. Yes, 
Yes, sir. But we ought always to come because daily you're blessing us. Yes, sir. And yes, every good and every perfect and every worthy good thing that happens yes, sir. comes to us by way of you. Thank you. Mm, thank you Lord. And so if we had a thousand tongues yes, yes. and if we spoke continuously over a period of time we would not begin to say thank you enough so we just thank you for all that you're doing with us. Yes. And we even want to thank you for what you have in mind for each one of us. We love you. And it's in our heart. Yes. To worship and to serve you. So continue to build us up. Continue to make us strong Please, Lord. Please, Lord. so that we can resist every offer coming from the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, we're approaching the end of another day. Well, well, thank you. Shortly, we're going to go into our homes. We will lay down and we will close our eyes. Yes. Watch over us all night long. Please, Lord. Protect us from the things that would cause us damage. And if this is a right prayer, wake each one of us up in the morning so that we can start another day, another day that has been given because of your grace. In the name of our Lord and Savior. In the name hmm. of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us, let us, let the church say, let the church say, let the church say. God has spoken. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen as we lift up our voices. Let the church say God has spoken, let the church say.